Thank you, I'm so happy to be here. And actually, really, I've, I've toured a bit of Santa Fe this morning and you must know how beautiful it is. So I'm really happy to be here and I'm happy to talk with you about, I've called this Reimagining Judaism in Israel. Uh, my premise is, uh, over the last 30 years, Jewish identity in Israel has changed significantly and has uh, developed into two different vectors. One, I would call ethno-nationalism, and the other I would call the privatization of religion. And how these two different directions in which Jews, through which Jews in Israel understand themselves, uh, are manifesting, and how, and I want, will want to talk about how they play out in politics in Israel, especially with the coming third election in Israel uh, two weeks from now. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I'll begin, and I'll begin by showing you this demographic pie chart. Uh, this is from the Israel Central Bureau of Statistics, the governmental body that uh, surveys uh, the uh, population in Israel. I will actually uh, uh, say another point before I begin. I am talking only of the Jewish population in Israel, only Jewish citizens in the state of Israel. That's about 77% of the citizens in Israel. There's another 20%. Arabs and 3% different kinds, which I will not address, okay? So bear this in mind. So this again is from, the, uh, from Israel's Central Bureau of Statistics and it divides the Israeli Jewish populace into the really classical fourfold division, the division into four different groups of secular, traditional, religious Zionist and ultra-Orthodox. Okay, secular, of course, being a secular Zionist, uh, traditional are the people or the descendants of people who came from Islamic countries to Israel. So that's Arab countries and Turkey and Persia, Iran today, and Azerbaijan, Kurdistan, etc., etc. Islamic countries that came to Israel. And then you've got the religious Zionist and the ultra-Orthodox. Okay? And this is from 2014. And really, I would like to say, if we look at this little pie chart, I really think that you can get almost no relevant information about Israeli populace from this chart. It's almost completely useless. And if I move to another chart, this chart, it is already a huge improvement. This is from the Jewish People Policy Institute, 2017. It's a private uh, research center. And as you can see, what is important here in my eyes is not that it gives different percentages of demographic slices of the population, but that it understands that the old fourfold division is no longer. There really is today a much broader, much more diversified way that Israelis understand themselves and that Israelis divide themselves between different Jewish identities. So this, I would say, is already a huge improvement. And, and really, when, when, when we look at these two, what I would like today to understand with you is how we moved from uh, right to left. What happened over the last 30 years, even a bit before, that the old fourfold div uh, division, which was relevant at the beginning of the state's existence, when the state was founded, and indeed until, I would say, the end of the 80s even. If you would try to understand the Israeli Jewish populace, the Israeli Jewish identity by those four different groups, you would be able to do it. You would have a, a good grasp of what's going on. Today, though, this is not the case. And I would like to understand with you how we moved from right to left 
when we talk about Israeli Jewish identity. And indeed, as we said, it's not only uh, this, left, uh, this left pie chart. We can add all sorts of new divisions to our understanding. This is a survey from the Israeli Democracy Institute from 2013. And when this survey was published, it caused a great surprise, a great even uh, sort of denial. It can't be true. It can't be true because this survey shows, as you can see, uh, in the uh, upper right corner here, that there are approximately 7.1% reform and conservative Jews in Israel. This is the first time that Jews in Israel were asked in a survey, what is their denomination? Now, maybe you know, we don't have denominations in Israel, right? Denominations are... Uh, an American thing, maybe a Euro European thing. We don't have, and, and indeed, accordingly, 56.6% said, well, we have no denomination, what are you talking about, right? And then you've got the 26.5% that said, oh, we are, we're orthodox, right? Because they know they're orthodox, right? But then that 7.1%, 3.2 conservative, 3.9 reform Jews, Israelis saying that they are reform and conservatives, again, that first... Uh, uh, the first thing it did is cause denial. It can't be because indeed we have about 150 combined uh, uh, congregations, uh, communities of reform and, and conservative Jews in Israel, but each one has a few tens, a few hundreds of people. That's not the three or 400,000 Jews that are 7.1% of the Jewish population in Israel. So where are all these Jews? These are Jews who identify as reform and conservative, but don't actually belong to any community, to any shul, which is reform and conservative. It still, of course, is very important that they identify as such. And in con consecutive surveys, we indeed found again and again that there are between 5 and 12 percent of the Jewish population that identify as either reform and conservative. Again, it's, you can't deny it. These people don't come to shul, but it is very important that they actually identify as such. So we can add them to the pie chart on the left. We've got them somewhere in the totally secular or maybe secular, a bit traditional, or maybe traditional. There's, there, they are somewhere there, right? And it's not only that. We can also add anti-religious secular Jews, which can be uh, uh, an identity of themselves. They're not only secular. They're not only not bothered by religion or not observing religion. They are actu actually actively anti-religious. They don't want any religious signs, uh, activity in their children's schools or in their streets, etc. And and they are active about it. Again, something that we need to consider. We can add another slice of Jewish population. I call this New Age Judaism. And, I say, and, and you, maybe you don't see the percentages, but this is between 5 to 30 percent. Because it really depends on how you define New Age or how do we define contemporary spirituality. But the fact is that in Israel today, there are quite a lot of Jews coming mainly from the secular and the, from the old secular and traditional divisions, groups in the Israeli society that dabble with Jewish tradition in all types of ways that we would call spiritual, right? Courses, workshops, uh, groups, prayer groups, teaching groups, etc. And, 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 and again, we need to take them into account something that we didn't have in the Israeli populace, in the Israeli Jewish populace before the 90s. We can also add, I call this new Haredim, new ultra-Orthodox. These are about 2%, maybe more, of ultra-Orthodox Jews that are being more and more integrated maybe even assimilated into the general Israeli public. They are no longer living only in their own neighborhoods and working only in 
a set number of occupations that ultra-Orthodox always uh, uh, look for. They are basically working everywhere, high-tech, lawyers, accountants, clerks, bus drivers, etc., while still being ultra-Orthodox, but integrating, even in forms of thought, more and more into Israeli society. So again, also another new bit, slice of Israeliness that we have to take into account. What happened? How did we get from this very simplistic way of understanding Israeli Jewish uh, identity that the Central Bureau of Statistics still uses, unfortunately, to something much more elaborate, much more complex, much more diverse in the Israeli society. What happened? What I want to propose that happened is a crisis of identity. And I am interpreting this change in Jewish identity, this diversification, as a fall of some sort of hegemony, a fall of some sort of overlaying identity that fractured and really is no more. And that identity is the secular Zionist identity, if we want to call it in a bit of a simplistic way. I've, I've brought these, this, this, you know, this familiar iconography, this sort of Soviet realistic artwork, <laughs> which, which you identify, I hope, as uh, early Zionist uh, posters, flyers, depicting early Zionists, depicting what these people thought of themselves. These were their ideals, right? And what do we see here? We see proud Jews, strong Jews. We see workers because, of course, they're socialists. We see egalitarianism because there's the female worker beside the male worker. We see military figures because they are not only proud, they also can defend themselves. They are active, maybe even militant. This is all opposed to the diasporic Jew right, which was passive, which was subdued, which, which was subjugated, and which we are now not as like, right? We are something else, these people told themselves, and they even have had names for this. This was the Hebrew. And you would hear people like Berdichevsky uh, or uh, and other uh, uh, early Zionist thinkers saying, we are no longer Jews. We have recreated ourselves, we have reimagined ourselves, and now we are Hebrews, we are something else. We are national, secular, proud Jews living on our ancestral land, and this allows us to begin anew. Okay? And it is important to understand, these people thought of their Jewish identity as the only authentic and legitimate way to be Jews in the 20th century. This is the modern Jew. You can no longer be an ultra-Orthodox Jew. You can no longer be a religious Jew. You can certainly, you can't be a diasporic Jew. You can't be a reform and conservative Jew. You can only be this sort of Jew, which, again, was the secular, socialist, Zionist type of Jew. They had a robust, a secure Jewish identity, which they uh, uh, not only uh, held to, but also basically uh, uh, tried to uh, instruct others to adopt. This was the hegemony, and it didn't let a lot of other identities live beside it quietly. But something happened to it. Right? We, don't, we no longer have this sort of Jew. We no longer have this sort of Jewish identity uh, in Israel or anywhere. What happened is quite a few processes, both ideological uh, and sociological and economic, that since the 70s fractured this Jewish identity. First, sociolog sociologically, there was the crisis of the Yom Kippur War, the 73 war in which uh, Israel experienced a great crisis of faith with its Mapainic labor movement socialist leadership. This same leadership that built the state, this same leadership that won the tremendous victory of 67, has failed us, right? 73, they were caught by surprise. 
A great many young soldiers lost their lives, and it was a crisis of faith. The Lebanon War in 1982, even though it was the, now the right-wing Likud government, only deepened that crisis of faith. But even more important than that were economic and, uh, and other sociological processes. Basically, since the end of the 70s and certainly in the 80s, the Israeli uh, economic market went through processes of privatization. Israel joined the Western world's market. Israel uh, had an influx of uh, global uh, um, funds and also global ideas. And the uh, Israeli economy was more and more privatized. Now, this privatization was not limited to the economy. When such privatization happens, something changes also in society. An ethos changes. Because if these people held an ethos of collectivism, of communalism, an ethos that, that uh, the motto of was one for all, right? I will sacrifice my life or my comfort for the greater good, for building a new model society in Israel, right? Uh, and I, and, and, and the word hagshama, fulfillment, right, meant that you actually went and built a kibbutz or were part of uh, a, a new garin that settled somewhere and built a new uh, spot of settlement with great personal sacrifice. This, that ethos is a, a part of a whole uh, ideological framework, which, of course, socialism was uh, the headline of, right? This was the labor movement's agenda. But when privatization uh, transforms the market, it transforms society as well. And a new ethos came up, an ethos of individualism, an ethos of self-fulfillment, an ethos in which it was no longer logical for me to sacrifice my life or my comfort for the collective. I'm not saying, of course, there are always instances, but in general. And this also fractured this sort of Jewish identity, which was hinged upon a collectivist point of view, a collectivist worldview. And finally, we also have the uh, great immigration or aliyah from the Soviet Union. In the 90s, about a million Jews came to Israel from the former Soviet Union, which did not hold to that old Zionist sort of point of view. They were simply not indoctrinated in that. They came fresh from another uh, uh, situation and were foreign to what uh, the soon-to-be-passed hegemony uh, propagated. All these reasons together fractured this hegemonic identity. And really what has happened is that for Jews in Israel, especially, of course, secular and traditional Jews in Israel, there was no longer a simple answer to the question, how am I Jewish? What makes me Jewish? Jews could not, they, they did not have that supplied, ready-made answer that the Hebrew offered them. Now, for some, for a minority, that's fine. They don't need to be Jews, right? They consider themselves citizens of the world or a, a, a universalist. It's okay by them. But for most Jews, for most secular Jews, certainly for most traditional Jews, they need a certain answer. They need to understand their Jewishness in a certain positive way. And that means that since the end of the 80s, Jews in Israel began seeking new answers for that question and began remodeling their Jewish identity. And they did so in two different avenues. As I said before, a privatized Judaism or a privatization of tradition and Jewish ethno-nationalism. And I want to go over them right now and, and understand what that means. First, the privatization of religion or what is is, is sometimes termed in Israel itself the Jewish Renaissance or the Jewish Awakening. What does that mean? Here is, that's a, it's a picture of, a, of a Rabbi Nachman of Braslev, Hasidic court, um, 
van that uh, basically uh, uh, brings uh, young Hasids that dance in the streets and try to, you know, spread the good word. <laughs> now, what does that mean? And, I, and to understand what that means, I, I want to bring a little text here that was said by a lady named Hens Foni from 2006. She says, we wanted to stop talking about the Sabbath and start experiencing it. In Bnei Jeshurun, we saw people like us, defined as secular, that prayer is a natural and authentic part of their life. In the beginning, we did not say Shema at all, because how can you say that? Then we placed it in the prayer book, but did not say it out loud, and anybody could choose to say it or not. Today, we read it out loud, and whoever does not want to, doesn't. Right? These are Jews, secular Jews, that in the 90s or the beginning of the 2000s went to the United States, to Bnei Jeshurun in Manhattan, right? And lo and behold, they saw Jews like them, not Orthodox Jews, they are taking a part, engaging, and even having fun with their tradition, enjoying themselves praying. And it's possible, this, it suddenly occurred to them, it's possible to be a secular Jew, not committed to the halakha, but still be engaged with your tradition. And so they came back to Israel and formed a prayer group, this, this prayer group itself, right, in Nahalal, that meets every Friday evening, Shabbat evening, right, and, and has a Kabbalat Shabbat together, singing, playing the guitar, praying, making kiddush on the wine, etc., right? A new concept in Israel. But a concept that was needed because these people looked for a new way to engage with their Jewishness, a new way to understand their Jewishness. And that was their way. Now that, of course, is only one little example. When we talk about the Jewish Renaissance or the privatization of Jewish tradition, we talk about a whole lot of Jewish uh, uh, phenomena in Israel. <coughs> uh, I've, I've divided these, these little pictures into two halves. The right half are all logos of uh, what we call in Israel uh, pluralistic batei midrash, pluralistic yeshivas, in which secular Jews come and learn the Talmud and learn ancient Jewish texts and do it in, under their own terms. So they are engaging with it, they're learning, not committed to halakha, and even sometimes understanding how they can uh, uh, inform and even um, uh, design or, or, or uh, describe their Judaism without halakhic observance. So these are all different, uh, different logos of this. The, two, the first two, uh, which is one of them is Elul and the other one uh, is the Oranim, the, the higher one. These two were opened in the same year, in, in 89, so you can actually pinpoint the exact year that it began. We've got uh, Alma and, uh, and um, Kolot, which were both a reaction to the uh, Prime Minister's Rabin assassination, so that's in 96 they were opened, also as a, as a, a wish to, to uh, engage with uh, Judaism, and, and et cetera, et cetera, right? And on the left side, you see different types of, uh, of, of, of this engagement, this privatized engagement with tradition, which is less intellectual and cultural and more spiritual. So you've got the, uh, right, the Bnei Baruch Kabbalah La'am Kabbalah Center, which is basically a, 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 a competitor of the Kabbalah Center you've got in uh, L.A., right? They're, it's more or less the same thing, but... They are in Israel, they are very big, they're the biggest new religious movement in Israel, holding a few tens of thousands, maybe 50,000 people, members. We've got, again, the neo-Hasidic uh, scene with the Braslav and Chabad and all sorts of uh, neo-Hasidic teachings, even with no Hasidic court, but you, you pray like a Hasid or you meditate as Hasids do, etc. We've got, again, another very big this time, a prayer group that meets every Friday evening. This is uh, at the port of Tel Aviv. And, and there are a few hundreds of people each time. And you've got different groups, different sort of 
new age or contemporary spirituality groups like this is Torah Yemima, just uh, 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 groups that, that popped up in Israel uh, teaching uh, their own concoction of Jewish uh, spiritual teachings. This one by this lady called Yemima, right? So there's a whole gamut, a whole diverse basket of this, of this, uh, uh, of this avenue. The way, this way that Jewish, secular, and traditional Jews in Israel re-engage with their tradition, and I am again emphasizing in a privatized way. Basically, they tailor-make their own Judaism as they wish, as is fulfilling for them, right? Now, this is not only a cultural phenomena. This has political repercussions. Here you can see a, 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 a newspaper article from January 2019, so a, a year and a, a bit ago. Fewer Israelis marrying through the rabbinate report shows. The Minister of Religious Services attributes the drop to general changes in marriage trends. However, the report is evidence of the growing contempt in Israel towards the rabbinate and the power it yields. Under the old paradigm, under the old hegemony of the Hebrew, the, that, that secular, that proud secular socialist Jew, the chief rabbinate had its place. It was the place in which Jews uh, came to have some professional help with important steps, important uh, uh, stages in their life. So, birth, or marriage, or divorce, or burial, giur, conversion, these were all handled by the professionals, right? By the chief rabbinate, and it, it had its place of honor uh, in Israeli society. But when your Judaism becomes privatized, when you get out of the simple secular uh, uh, Hebrew identity and you re-engage actively with your tradition and you now learn something about your, your tradition and you tailor-make your tradition, you sometimes or many times no longer have tolerance for ultra-Orthodox Jews claiming to be the only authentic way to be Jewish and also coercing their way on you. And thus, many more Israelis today, I mean, growing numbers of Israelis today are marrying outside of the chief rabbinate, something, by the way, which is illegal in Israel. Right? You cannot marry outside of the chief rabbinate. Certainly, you're not registered as married. They are continuing to be common law married. And indeed, the law even says that uh, some might go to jail for up to two years for such such a, uh, an unlawful act, but I mean, seriously, this law will never be upheld, but that, that's the, I mean, enforced, but that's the letter of the law. So the privatization of tradition changes the way a majority of Israelis, seculars and traditionals, view the chief rabbinate. Many of them will not accept its authority anymore. And indeed, the chief rabbinate, as this report says, there's a growing contempt towards it. It, we, it is maybe the, the public institution which is the most despised, I would even say, among secular Israelis, uh, secular Jews in Israel. That's privatization of, of tradition. I want now to continue to ethno-national Judaism. Now, a, a word of caution. I want to, uh, I want to give a caveat here. Ethno-nationalism is a nasty word. I understand that. I am not using it necessarily as a nasty thing. I don't think it is inherently a nasty thing. It is sometimes hard for Americans to understand, but most nation states around the world are ethnic nation states. Um, Spain, Japan, the Baltic states, Hungary, whatever, right? Many, many states are based on a certain ethnic group, which the state uh, is its manifestation of self-sovereignty and self-definition, right? There's nothing wrong with that inherently. Of course, it can go wrong. It can uh, uh, deteriorate towards nationalism in the negative sense of the world. But 
But when I'm using this, I mean to, uh, to describe a phenomena first and foremost. Okay? Now, what is ethno-national Judaism? It is, again, a type of identity, a type of answer for the question, how am I Jewish? And this is an answer which is a very simple answer. It goes to the uh, uh, lowest common denominator. I am a Jew because I am part of the Jewish people. I am a Jew because I have Jewish blood, because I am ethnically Jewish, because I have Jewish parents, and because I am very much connected to the Jewish people. I wish for the Jewish people's protection and longevity and, uh, uh, and, and success, and I'm usually very vocal about it, and I'm also very vocal about people who aren't enough patriotic or identified as such, in my opinion, right? That, I would say, is this uh, identity. And I've brought here a picture which I myself took uh, in Machne Yehuda Market in Jerusalem. This is a man walking around with a fantastically large uh, <laughs> blue and white flag. In the middle it says, Ve'asuli Mikdash, they, they, they founded a temple for me. This is, a, of course, a verse from the Bible. It's, a, it's the temple. And he has a Golani brown beret, and he had a Golani brigade of the IDF. He has a shirt with uh, Rav Meir Kahana, Rabbi Meir Kahana, uh, on it, and he has a little a ghetto blaster there under his arm, blasting out the tikva in rap. Okay? <laughs> now, obviously, this is a bit of a caricature. Obviously, this is an extreme case, but it exemplifies, it illustrates this type of ethno-national Jewish identity. What is his Judaism? His Judaism is being very national, patriotic, right, in love with the Jewish people and being very vocal about it. That's his Jewish identity. Now, how do we see that in society? I, I brought two quotes that I want to show you. These two quotes are from the... Uh, or from religious Zionist figures, but they illustrate this in a fantastic way, I think. And the first is uh, Naftali Bennett, who is today the leader of the Religious National Party. My wife is secular, I am Israeli and a Jew. My basic identity is not religious, right? This is an Orthodox observant Jew, right? At least that's what he exemplifies, or that's what he presumes to be. And, and he says, my basic identity is not religious. What is it? It's national. Look at the second quote. This is a person who, has, uh, who, has, who is uh, born in an Orthodox family but left the fold, uh, stopped being observant, and he says, even after I cease to be religious, there is a feeling that my parents and the community will be much, more, much so more hurt if you become a leftist, because that is perceived as real betrayal. <laughs> right? So for his parents, the fact that he is no longer observant is, of course, saddening, but not as tragic as if he were to be a leftist, right? <laughs> so what here is the center of his Jewish identity? Not halacha, not observance. The center of his Jewish identity, which, which if he would uh, negate would be betrayal, is nationalism. Is, in this case, right-wing patriotism, politics, whatever. This is how this plays out. And as you can see, it also affects religious Zionists, not only secular Jews or traditional Jews in Israel. And of course, as with Jewish privatized religion, this also translates itself to politics. And I want to give you two examples. First, easy, the nation state basic law that was passed in 2018. I've, you must have heard this about this in the news. And, and this basic law, I mean, it's very basic in, 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 in a few different meanings of the word. Uh, just, to, just, to, but just to make sure you understand, basic laws are the laws in Israel that are presumed to be a, uh, um, to be a, a beginning of a future constitution, to be the basis of a future constitution. So you've got a few basic laws, and this is the basic law concerning nationality in Israel, and it explicitly 
decrees that the land of Israel is the historical homeland of the Jewish people in which the state of Israel was established. The state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people in which it realized its natural, cultural, religious, historical right to self-determination. The exercise of the right to national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. Now, there's nothing new about that, right? This is even recognized by the United Nations, right? Of course, the state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. What, what is... What is important for us to understand is that this law would not have been uh, set down in writing in 2018 were it not perceived as needed to the public, to the government's own electorate base, to bold, to underline these facts. And, what, what, and the other thing that is important in this law is what is not in it. And what is not in it is a clause that says, even let's say G or, or, or Y or something, that says all citizens in Israel deserve equal protection under the law and of their rights, etc. This is missing from this law. And again, it's not, it's not by accident. There are such laws in other countries in the world, but that clause is always there. It's not here because what was important for the Legislators here is to emphasize the fact that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people and only of the Jewish people and not emphasize the fact or even ignore the fact that there are other communities in Israel which are not, other people which are not Jewish. And this is an expression of what I was saying. Another expression is something, I, I'm bringing a, a, an illustration from what, something that Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu said this is maybe exactly a year ago, right? A year, a year minus a week ago, and a week ago. This is before the April election, the first election in the current cycle, in which Netanyahu almost forced a unification of all the right-wing religious Zionist parties, including the Kahanist racist party, and got a lot of uh, flack for that, and Netanyahu then uh, uh, shot back and said, well, uh, you know, hits back. Well, uh, I'm, I'm reading only the, the, the bolded part, the marker part. Herzog has prompted a deal with a joint list and said Arab MKs were legitimate as an addition to the government. But what is he saying here? I mean, of course Arab MKs elected representatives of the Arab citizenship in Israel. How can they not be a legitimate addition to the government. They can not be a legitimate addition to the government only in ethno-nationalist eyes, which view the state of Israel not only as the nation state of the Jewish people, but really as belonging to the Jews, and in which other non-Jewish citizens have lesser rights, or they do not belong as much to the state and the state to them. This, and, and, and here again, this is what ethno-nationalism this time, when it does go overboard, when it does turn into something negative in a democracy, looks like. So, so these are the two vectors, and this is how they play out, both socially and politically. And now I would like to... Uh, uh, to mention another thing, these, these two vectors are contradictory but also complementary. And that's what I want to stress. They're contradictory in a way, of course, because the more privatized version is more liberal, is more uh, uh, individualistic, and the more ethno-nationalist is a bit less liberal many times, and certainly collectivist uh, in its agenda, right? But they are also complementary, and I want to show that, uh, again returning to the issue of marriage in Israel. Less and less people are married through the chief rabbinate, but what does that mean? These are beliefs uh, held by Israeli Jews. This is a survey from 2009, so it's a decade and a bit ago, uh, but I think it is still relevant and, and, and good, and, and I want to quickly go through it and, uh, and see what's relevant for us. So, 
80% of Jews in Israel believe there is a God, 80% 80 also that there is a reward for good deeds, 77% believe that there is a divine force directing the world, 74% believe there is punishment for bad deeds. By the way, notice there are less people believe in punishment for bad deeds than in reward for good de de deeds, right? <laughs> this is a universal phenomenon. We always, we always believe that God is more good than bad. It doesn't, it's not stringent, you know, it's not really. Anyway, 72% believe that prayer can help one get out of trouble. 67% believe that the Jewish people is the chosen people. 65% believe that the Torah is a divine commandment. 51% believe in the coming of the Messiah. And 34% believe that not observing halakha endangers the Jewish people. Okay, there are a few interesting points here. Uh, by the way, I would say that the first point, there is a God, 80% is not interesting. I don't think we should take it in any serious way because that can mean anything. I mean, the God here can be very amorphous and uh, uh, shapeless and can have, almost, uh, have virtually no effect about how we live and how we think. So that's irrelevant. But the fact that Jews, let's say, believe, many of them, that prayer can help get one out of trouble is significant, right? Believe in the power of prayer, 72%. And no less significant, the fact that 67% believe that the Jewish people is the chosen people. And here I would say there, there is also a, a, an, a, an inkling of, of, of this ethno-nationalist, I would say, uh, uh, ethos. But overall, we can see that the Jews in Israel are many times secular in the way they live, but not in their belief system. Many Jews in, in Israel are believers, right, in different things. And I would contrast that with this survey. This is support in Israel for all types of marriage, all types meaning civil marriage and LGBT marriage since 2009 until 2018. And as you can see, support has uh, grown uh, in a very significant way. And today, you know, 70% is a large majority of Jewish Israelis supporting all types of marriage. Again, contrast this with this from the same survey, this time divided into political parties. And as you can see, Right? This is the Likud, Kulan, which is today part of the Likud. Israel Beitenu, this is Lieberman. Labor, Yesh Atid, this is today blue and white. Meretz, the, the extreme left uh, Zionist party. Habayta, Yehudi, Shas, and Yadut Torah. And you can see that only, only the three religious parties have a majority that uh, is opposed to all types of marriage. All the secular parties, including the Likud, have a large majority for all types of marriage. What does that mean? I think that means that the Jewish populace in Israel, even though it is fairly traditional, and even though many times it will hold on to what I call an ethno-nationalist understanding of its Judaism, is in other ways very liberal about what it can tolerate in the Israeli public sphere. Jews here will allow for other Jews to get married however they want, even though they themselves many times will marry through the chief rabbinate. They don't want to leave the chief rabbinate, many of them. Many do, of course, and the ones that don't want to allow for civil marriage. And, and, and here you have actual, again, uh, percentages. This again, assuming all these options would be available, which would you choose for yourself or your children? 47% of Jews in Israel would choose the chief rabbinate, the orthodox way. Okay? 14% reform or conservative, 31% civil marriage, etc. So these, so if we have 70% of Jews in Israel agreeing to civil marriage, or LGBT marriage, and 47% marrying through the Orthodox chief rabbinate, it is clear that some, many, of those who will marry through the chief rabbinate don't care or are tolerant enough 
to allow other Jews to marry through civil marriage, right? Through the courts or through reform and conservative movements. It means, I think, and this is just an illustration for a much broader process, it means that in many, in many fields of life, Jewish Israelis have become more liberal, have become more tolerant of different types of Judaism. This also corresponds to the fact that there are more different types of Judaism around them. And I would even say that many times the fact that these Jews hold on to an, what I call an ethno-nationalist form of Judaism allows them to be tolerant. It's, it's in a way they are thinking, if I have to word it, uh, they will think, as long as we are secure in our tribal Jewishness, again, a, a very low common denominator, but if we are secure in that, yes, you can you know, play around, do whatever you want with your how you marry or how you study the Talmud, what you do on Sabbath, I don't want to coerce anything on you. Right? There is this sort of dynamics which makes the privatization of religion and ethno-national Judaism also not only contradictory but complementary because this allows that in Israel and I think if you look at the public sphere in Israel today you will see that certainly in all Jewish matters it has become much more liberal than it was 30 years ago. Finally, we come to politics. And when we come to politics, and I, want to, I want to mention how, how religion plays a part over the last few elections, which were this year. This is a political map in Israel. Uh, I've, the, the center uh, vertical line, right is, uh, of course, left and right, and the horizontal right line I will, I will address uh, later a bit. So we've got the Likud, and I, and I couldn't find English logos for these. The Likud, blue and white, these are the two religious parties, Shas and Yadot HaTorah. Lieberman here at the, about the center. Yemina, this is the religious Zionist party. This is the Rashima Amshotef, the, the combined or mutual party of the Arab citizens in Israel, and this is now, Ha'avodah, Gesher, Meretz, Labor, Gesher, and Meretz, uh, more to the left, <coughs> Jewish Zionist party. And then you've got here, Otzma Yudi, these are the Kahanists, this election they will run alone. Uh, if, we, if we look at this, if we remember the identities that I've charted out generally, you, we can also, again, this is a bit of a generalization, but we can also place the privatization of religion with Kahol Lavan and the more ethno-national Judaism with the Likud, right? If we, if we look at how these uh, parties play out their politics and their agendas, etc., et and we can see in the results of the last two elections, the April 2019 and the September 2019 elections, how religion directly influenced uh, the results of the election. This is the result, these are the results of the, I know you're not seeing this, don't worry about it, I'll, I'll, I'll explain. This is the results of the April 2019 elections and, and if we take all the, the, the Likud cluster, Netanyahu's cluster of parties, Netanyahu, oh, should be 60. Netanyahu and his uh, basically ultra-Orthodox religious Zionist parties together, they've got 60 seats. That's why they couldn't make a government. You need 61 out of 120 seats in our parliament, right? This is the parliamentary system. I hope, right? <laughs> we don't elect a person, we elect a party, right? And then you have to make a coalition. They couldn't make, they couldn't reach a 61 majority. That's why we went to another election. And in the next election, September, that same cluster of parties came out with 55 seats. What happened? What happened in a space of three months? I propose that what happened is a new agenda that was for these elections, the agenda of religion and state. And this is the uh, uh, slogan that Lieberman went to the elections with. It says, Lieberman, yes to a Jewish state, no to a halachic state. 
halachic state in Hebrew, also under, or in Israel, understand it as a theocracy. Yes to a Jewish state, no to a theocracy. And this is exactly pinpointing the consensus that I charted out. We want a Jewish identity, so of course we want a Jewish state. We don't want religious coercion. We are now privatized enough to reject such communal collectivist uh, programs. This is the slogan of the Blue and White Party, Benny Gantz, right? He, she, he says, only a large Blue and White will, found, or will uh, establish a, a unified secular government. This is their slogan the last two weeks of the election, right? The election was about secularism uh, on one side and allegedly theocracy on the other side. And this is Netanyahu tweeting out the state of Israel will not be a halachic state. He had to spell this out because one of his broader coalition members, Bitsalad Smotrich, a very uh, extreme religious Zionist uh, politician, said that his dream is for Israel to be a halachic state. So Netanyahu went out of his way and tweeted it won't happen. Why? Because he knew that voters are afraid of such things, and, and, and even right-wing voters hearing Smotrich say such things could have voted for blue and white, and I think did indeed vote in the end to blue and white, and that's why five whole seats in the parliament were uh, withdrawn from the Likud's um, cluster of parties. Right? Finally, Going into these elections, again, uh, we basically see the same thing. I don't know if the religion and state issue will be so much on the agenda this election. I think if blue and white are smart, they will try to push it into the agenda because that's what gave them an advantage last time. Uh, and, and I, of course, will open for questions about this. I will just say that this map, I wanted to address also the horizontal line. If the vertical line divides between right and left, the horizontal line divides between active and, or passive and active. The, the, these um, parties, these political parties are basically satisfied with the status quo in terms of policy, geopolitics, the situation with the Palestinians, the economy. They don't want to rock the boat too much. And these parties here, right and left, want a change. The left, of course, want to go forward and start negotiations in, uh, for, uh, towards a Palestinian independent state. And the right, of course, wants annexation, broadening of settlements, etc. This is, in general, what we are seeing here. So now I think I will uh, end my presentation. Thank you.